good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is so disappointing that we were not able to host this event in person as planned. However, uh, the one thing we have learned how to do over the past 18 months or so is to roll with the punches, and we are delighted that you were able to join us online. So welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Dr. Sachin Seth from the Faculty of Dentistry here at Dalhousie University. Uh, I'm also the, currently the acting dean while Dr. Ben Davis is away on sick leave. Uh, he's so sorry that he missed this evening, but I'm happy to say that he'll be back with us next week. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to say just a few words about the J.D. McLean Lecture, uh, which is a long-standing tradition in the Faculty of Dentistry. This annual lecture began in 2004 in honor of a former dean, Dr. James D. McLean. Dr. McLean believed that it is important for healthcare professions to have a broader view uh, and hear from leaders in fields outside of dentistry. I think that's such an important part of, uh, of who we are and how we're successful in dentistry is to have interests outside of that. And it's really wonderful to have people share those. So today's lecture promises to be a real treat, not only in the insights we are about to hear, but in the images we will see. Our speaker, Rick Gudati, is a former fashion photographer who switched his focus 25 years ago to celebrate and capture the beauty he sees in individuals living with genetic, physical, behavioral, and intellectual differences. He also created the nonprofit organization Positive Exposure to work with advocacy groups, educational institutions, medical schools, hospitals, museums, and galleries to bring about change in the way these individuals are seen and treated and to promote a more inclusive world. Rick is really interested to hear your ideas and questions at the end of this presentation, so uh, please bear that in mind as you listen. Rick, we are so delighted that you have joined us virtually from New York City, and we are excited to hear your and, and see your presentation. Rick, over to you. Such an honor to be here. I'm just going to share my screen right now as we speak. Such an honor. To, are we okay here? We all see this? So we're all good? Great. So it's, it's an honor to be here. I'm so sorry I'm not there in person. It's my, it was a, 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 a snafu with my, my COVID test. I'm negative, but at the same time I had the wrong test, so I apologize. But I'm so glad we can still join each other and, and speak to each other and I can meet you today. Uh, so I'm Rick Bodotti, the founder of Positive Exposure. Uh, I used to, I started my career as a fashion photographer, started working with, in, uh, living in Milan in Paris. My studio was here in New York City, which is where I'm coming in from. Uh, I, but I worked for clients like L'Oreal and Revlon and Harper's Bazaar and Elle Magazine. Here's the amazing Claudia Schiffer from a Harper shoot. Uh, this is from a, a Marie Claire photo shoot. Marie Claire once again. I did a lot of work for the house of Yves Saint Laurent in Paris. This is a portrait of Mr. Saint Laurent that's in every boutique worldwide and an image from one of our global campaigns. Uh, from French Elle magazine, New York Style magazine, Elle magazine, French Elle, sorry. And of course, the amazing Cindy Crawford from a Revlon shoot. It was so exciting working with these incredible models, these incredible clients around the globe, thrilling, but at the same time, really frustrating because I was told every day who was beautiful. As an artist, I refuse to see beauty just on covers of magazines. I see beauty everywhere. And I was forced to work within the parameters of somebody else's idea of beauty. I was leaving my studio one afternoon after doing a casting for Elle magazine and walking down Park Avenue, I spotted this gorgeous kid waiting for a bus. She had long, white, white, white hair, pale skin. She had this genetic condition called albinism. Albino was the common term that I knew. She was so beautiful, yet I had never met a model that looked like this kid. I'd never met a model that, that shared this beauty. I was like, that had this condition. So I, I wanted to grab her and just like, I have to take your photograph, you're amazing. But the bus came and she got on the bus and I always say this in all my lectures currently, and I'm thrilled that that bus came and she got on the bus because she was 12 years old and I'd probably still be in been lots of trouble still to this day. But I didn't know where I was gonna, I was gonna find photographs of this gorgeous kid or photographs of in the friends of hers that had the same genetic condition albinism. So I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York City. I studied photography, filmmaking, and art. I never saw a medical textbook prior to that moment, but I thought that's where it's going to be. I want to find those images. So I went to a medical textbook, pulled it off shelf, opened it up to where to the albinism. So excited to find these images of this gorgeous kid, but instead these are the images that I saw. 
The red eye caption was called the albino eye. That was the caption of that photograph, the albino eye. This kid did not have red eyes. She had blue eyes, beautiful blue eyes. Then I saw lots of images in cancer clinics and cancer wards around the globe, images of sores and cancers on people's backs. All the, you don't see any of the faces, it's always just the cancer itself. But then I saw lots of photographs of not just kids with albinism, but many genetic and conditions always represented the same way, usually up against a wall in a doctor's office with a black bar across their eyes. Oftentimes the kids were in their na were naked or in their underwear. I thought, ooh, this is not what I'm looking for. I very happily shut that medical textbook, put it back up on the shelf, hoping to never have to see another medical textbook for the rest of my life. So I went to an encyclopedia thinking, ah, that's gonna be. And in the encyclopedia, I found the family in the circus. I'm thinking, this is getting worse and worse. And the more I started digging, the more negative representation of people with albinism I was finding. And Hollywood certainly was always from the princess bride to powder with the hat and the glasses. His mother, had, he had albinism because his mother was struck by lightning when she was pregnant with him. To the bottom left, the, the, the matrix reloaded. They were evil ghost-like characters that would come in, they would wreak havoc, and then they'd just simply disappear. So the most recently, the Da Vinci Code was evil Silas driving around Paris at night shooting at people. One of the first things I discovered in my research about albinism is that most people with this genetic condition have a visual impairment. In fact, most people living with albinism are considered legally blind. So certainly would not be traveling around Paris shooting at anybody and expect to hit any of those targets. So the information I was discovering was terrible. It was all wrong. And, and I was just like, this is, but then I noticed that there was a support group for the National Organization for Albinism and Hypopigmentation here in the United States. This is a support group for people living with this condition and their families. So I called them immediately. I was so excited to get in touch with them. I said, hey, I'm a fashion photographer. Let's show the world the beauty of albinism. This is gonna be amazing. They said, get lost. Yeah, I'm pretty persistent. I'm a New Yorker, kind of went after them. They made it very clear to me early days about their fear of exploitation. That every time there was a, a, a magazine article about a person with albinism, it was always the story about a victim. It was always exploitative. It was always sensational. It was always negative. And I said, well, I have to, I, I, I agree with you. I can't find one positive representation of albinism. And I've been searching. So let's do something strange here. Let's form a non-traditional partnership fashion photographer, genetic support group, genetic advocacy support group, and together we'll partner and we'll create photographs uh, that actually celebrate the beauty of albinism. And they agreed. So I was so excited, positive exposures, born that day, we're getting ready to get started. In walks the first girl I'm gonna photograph. Her name is Christine, and she's stunning. She has long, long white hair, pale skin, she's about five, nine, beautiful but she walks into the studio with her shoulders hunched head down one word answers no eye contact I was instantly aware that this i was instantly aware of the fact that this kid had zero self-esteem as a, a direct result of the bullying the teasing and the abuse she experienced in the classroom environment. I never met anybody with zero self-esteem for her. She was just standing thinking, how am I going to photograph this kid? But just the day before on the same set in my studio, I photographed Cindy Crawford for another Revlon shoot. And I thought, out of respect for this gorgeous kid, I'm going to photograph her like I would any supermodel. So the fan went on, the music went on, and I literally grabbed a mirror that was next to the set. And I held it up to Christine and I said, Christine, look at yourself. You're magnificent. And this kid looked in the mirror. She's standing like this. She looked in the mirror and for the first time she saw exactly what I saw. And she put her hands on her hips. Her head went up in the air and she exploded with a smile that literally lit up New York City. That's the stunning Christine. Gorgeous Christine desperately needed to change the way she saw herself. Her community desperately needed to change the way that they saw her difference. So she created the philosophy that still drives positive exposure today. And that philosophy is change how you see, see how you change. 
Those first images were in the Life Magazine spread. It was a cover story called Redefining Beauty. Now, lots of accolades for that, with that, but it also helped me identify people all around the globe living with albinism. As I was traveling doing my fashion work, I'd connect with the albinism community in the UK or in Australia or in Africa, wherever I happened to be on location doing my fashion work, I'd always connect with the community. So we started creating images around the globe of people with albinism. A little background on albinism. Albinism is a recessive genetic condition, uh, and the incidence worldwide is about 1 in 20,000 worldwide. This is Gladys Mir. She's a Kuna Indian in the San Blas region of Panama, where it's the highest incidence in the world. It's 1 in 125. This is Mare from Fiji, and, and we're living with, with her four kids. Mare comes from Fiji where they, at the turn of the 19th century, a tribe could not hold their territory. Let's say somebody with albinism in a powerful political position. So Mare comes from a community that celebrates her albinism. Harry from Puerto Rico, Suana from Korea, Maizan and her sister and their mom together, we started the first albinism society of Malaysia. This is Natalia. Together we started the first Albinism Society of Russia about eight years ago. This is Pranish from India. Kiar from New Zealand. Lauren from Australia. My great friends from the Slowey School for the Blind in Polokwane in northern province of South Africa. These are twin boys in Tanzania, in East Africa. There's a horrible thing going on in East Africa where witch doctors, not all, but some witch doctors, are saying, bring me the bones of an albino, and I'll make a potion that will make you rich. So these kids are often hunted for their body parts. This isn't a thousand years ago. This is recent. Most recently, about six months ago, a young, a young boy of eight years old was found murdered, missing his arms, his legs, and his genitals. Uh, so we're working very closely with the government agencies, non-governmental agencies, organizations like Under the Same Sun that are based in Dar es Salaam and also in Canada, uh, creating opportunities to really stop these atrocities, raise awareness, and challenge the, the superstitions that are associated with albinism in many communities. We've created and distributed over 350,000 of these maps showing that albinism exists naturally around the world, not just in that one village in Tanzania that's often thought. So, and that's hoping, uh, so working with so many great communities there. I received a lot of awards for the Life Magazine piece, Redefining Beauty, but one of the most honored that I, uh, uh, award that I received was from an organization called the Genetic Alliance. The Genetic Alliance is a coalition of all the genetic support groups based in DC in, in the US. And, I, and as I was receiving the Art of Reporting Award, the president at the time said, I'm looking at all these beautiful images of albinism around the world, and they're stunning, but there's a universal message here. This isn't just about albinism. This is about all differences. Would you ever care to collaborate with one of our other advocacy organizations that we represent here at the Alliance so they, those families too can celebrate their differences? I was like, what a great idea. Of course, I would love to do that. Fantastic. So, well, we have a conference coming up on the Chromosome 18 Registry and Research Society. It's in San Antonio in a few weeks. Would you go? I'm like, well, what does that mean? She said, well, when you have an anomaly on your 18th chromosome. Now, I'm a fashion photographer. I had never heard the words chromosome and anomaly used in the same sentence prior to that moment. So I agreed to go, but I thought I needed to go back to this, revisit those medical textbooks to find out what exactly that means. And these are the images that I saw in those medical textbooks under chromosome anomalies. A lot of images of kids naked up against black walls with black bars across their eyes. So a lot of images of stillborns, a lot of images of kids with cleft palates and trachs and feeding tubes and mobility issues. And this was terrifying. I thought albinism was so easy compared to this. But I committed to going to San Antonio, Texas, and I went and I had these images burned in my head and as I walked into the auditorium there was a, where there was a clown entertaining kids on, on stage, I walked in with these images burned in my head and as I walked into the room I was instantly surrounded by kids screaming with laughter. There were kids there with cleft palates and trachs and feeding tubes and mobility issues but they were kids and they were having fun. It was amazing. It just changed everything. These are some of the great kids that I met. This is Pauline. The incredible Sean, who I've been photographing every year since. Ellington, the coolest kid I know. 
Remy, who's senior photograph, her senior graduate photographs we just created last summer. And it wasn't, this is Rebecca, they weren't just kids, they were, they were people. This is Rebecca from Chicago. And I thought, wow, where was that one giggle when I was trying to research what a chromosome anomaly was, where that one smile, it would have changed everything. But back to my studio after this great experience, and I was approached by Francis Collins, who was then the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at the National Institutes of Health. And he just, they had just mapped the human genome and wanted to create a photographic exhibition that was going to, uh, uh, celebrating the people's genomes that was going to launch at the Museum of Natural History in DC and then travel to other Smithsonian sites globally. And he asked me if I would create a photographic exhibition showing albinism and the diversity within albinism around the globe. I said, this is a great idea. I love that. But then I told him about there's a universal messenger. So I just had this experience at the chromosome registry, chromosome 18 registry. And let's invite all the genetic support groups that, would, that are as many as we can to participate in this people's genome celebration. And he agreed. So together with the Genetic Alliance, which is a tremendous outreach, and all the genetic support groups really wanted to get involved and get excited to celebrate their differences. The first group that stepped up was the National Marfan Foundation. Chris Marfan syndrome is a connective tissue disorder. You grow very, very tall. You're at least given aortic dissection. You have scoliosis, pectus excavatum, long, thin arms and legs. And when I saw that photograph in the medical textbook, I finally understood the importance of the, these types of photographs in medical textbooks. So how, as a healthcare provider or healthcare provider in training, will you identify a connective tissue disorder in the clinical environment? Well, here it is. And I thought, okay, I get it. Now, as an artist, there has to be another way that I can give you all the information that you need to take care of somebody with Marfan syndrome or to identify it, but add a key ingredient that's missing. And of course, that key ingredient is Billy. And that key ingredient is humanity. This is Christopher. Now, everybody's a critic, an art director as well. Christopher was very proud of his Marfan syndrome, very proud of his long fingers and his long arms and his pectus carinatum and his scoliosis. That was him, and he was very proud of that. And there he was, and he wanted to be photographed, and that's what we did, and we created that image. The opening night of the exhibition, um, hanging from the ceiling in the rotunda of the Museum of Natural History in DC was Christopher's photograph. It was eight foot square. And that evening, it was a great, huge party. The launch was amazing. This woman approached me and said, my dad has Marfan syndrome. I have Marfan syndrome. And every summer we go to the beach with our friends and family and we cover up our pectus excavatum and our scoliosis and our long thin arms with our beach gear. But after meeting Christopher, I am so buying a bikini. Change how you see, see how you change. I want to introduce you to some of our other friends. This is Caleb, living with a very common form of skeletal dysplasia or dwarfism called achondroplasia dwarfism. Caleb wants to be the president of the United States or an actor. And we're thrilled to say when I told him all about uh, Ronald Reagan, he's now convinced that he could do both. And chances are he could do both. So when you're looking at the U.S. President next to him, politics, keep your eyes and ears open for the amazing Caleb. This is Dr. Nadia. This is Dr. I'm sorry. Doctor, this is Dr. Nadia from. Uh, oh, sorry. I should turn it there. I got it. Thanks. Sorry about that. This is. I have my time on. That's what the phone was on. This is Dr. Nadia. She's. Uh, I met Dr. Nadia when she was in the in the Middle East. She was in uh, at Cornell, while Cornell in Doha in education study, and she was a second year med student. And she, she has a very rare form of skeletal dysplasia called acromesomelic dysplasia. And Dr. Nadia told me when she was a second year med student that the only thing she needs to be a successful healthcare provider or practitioner or doctor is a stepladder. And she got that step ladder, and she went on to she went on to become a doctor. She did her 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 uh, residency at Children's Hospital Dayton, Ohio. Then on to her postdoc at Baylor, and now she's in D.C. And that's the amazing Dr. Nadia. And about a year ago, just about a year ago, she got married, and I was there and so, virtually, but it was amazing, it was extraordinary. I actually went to this conference. Let me turn that thing around. It was my very first Rhizopathies conference. I've never been to a Rhizopathies conference before, and it was the particular on Costello syndrome. So as I walked in, I met Maggie and Danielle, and as it turns out, it was their very first Costello syndrome conference. They never met anyone that shared the same syndrome. And I was there when they met, and I was there when they became 
instant best friends. It was extraordinary to see that and to see, what, see that bond form right in front of me. And all weekend during the family conference, you would hear them giggling and laughing and running down every hallway r- r- passing by all the conference rooms. It was amazing. And every year I go back to the, the, the Costello Syndrome Conference and the other Rizopathies, and there they are, still best friends. The only thing that's changed over the years is they're, they've started a rock and roll band and they're pretty amazing. They're really loud, but they're great. <laughs> that's good. My fr- friend Jada living with 22Q11.2 deletion, greatest giggle on the planet. Simone living with Down syndrome. Simone represents the National Down Syndrome Foundation of Italy. Go to a lot of family conferences. I speak to a lot of medical schools, and I was speaking to med students at Harvard one year, and they invited me to come to a conference that they host every year for kids. It's an advanced conference for kids that are very vulnerable, medically fragile, living with spinal muscular atrophy in an advanced in an advanced clinic. So I didn't know much about it, but I went to my medical textbooks to find out, get some information about SMA, and the first word that I saw in bold letters was progressive. So I knew that these kids was an advanced clinic. I know a lot of these kids were very very medically fragile, maybe not even be there in the next year. So as I got to that conference, it was a little not as, yay! As I'm trying to be a little bit careful, I instantly met these gorgeous kids and these beautiful families and we started photographing. And as I'm shooting, I'm looking at all the photographs and every single photograph is in fo- is out of focus. And the reason they were out of focus is because these kids spent the whole time trying to run me over in their wheelchairs. This is after running over my left and my right foot at the same time. Then, so at the farewell dinner, I presented the photographs back to the families that evening and started telling stories. And I got a standing ovation from the siblings who were so thrilled that somebody finally sees the rotten brother for the truly rotten brother that he is. So that was kind of amazing. Change how you see, see how you change. Beautiful Lily living with Wolf Hirschhorn syndrome. Curtis and Alex living with vitiligo. Curtis and Alex refuse to apologize. I'm slide it over there. Refuse to apologize for their vitiligo. They're very excited to um, to to you know, just to change the, the the language and not to be thought of as being somebody that has a, a suffering with vitiligo or a victim of vitiligo. They're very happy to have a better understanding that they are living with vitiligo. Uh, uh, Curtis, he's the, the, the older kid, he's a, a major sports figure in his high school, a great basketball, he's a star, a celebrity. And then and Alex wants to be a stand-up comedian. And neither one of them re- will ever apologize for their vitiligo, nor will they use any kind of cover-up because it's, this is who they are. And they're not suffering, they're living with. And I thought that was pretty, pretty amazing. So I'm sorry, I did something wrong here. I don't know what I did exactly. I think it's probably better there. There we go. This is Tyler living with congenital melanocytic nevus syndrome. Lucas living with fragile X syndrome, of course, the leading familial genetic marker for autism. That's Lucas and his dad. Ronan living with Prater Willi syndrome. I just love using this photograph because he reminds me so much of Frank Sinatra. He's an extraordinary kid. Here's Deirdre living with Smith McGinnis syndrome. Jack living with tuberous sclerosis. Great smile, Jack. And Liam with Dravet living with Dravet syndrome. Here's beautiful Chloe living with cerebral palsy. Uh, Chloe is nonverbal, but will often go into the clinic and I'll hear from her mom quite often that when she walks into the clinic, the clinician will look right to her mom and will speak to the mom directly, will not really even make any of those connections with Chloe because Chloe is nonverbal. Well, as you can see in this photograph, nonverbal doesn't mean non-communicative. Chloe will let you know exactly what she's thinking, what she's feeling, but you just have to figure out another way of looking with her of connecting. So we're really using Chloe so often to help healthcare providers in training have a much better understanding of ways of how we can connect and ways to, to communicate. But just let Chloe lead the lead, take the leadership on this. It's she's extraordinary. 
When it comes to advocates and ambassadors and human rights and disability rights activists, there's none other greater than the amazing Judith Human. Judy um, is part of the film. I hope many of you have seen Crip Camp. It won, it was nominated for an Academy Award in documentaries. It also won the Audience Choice Award in Sundance, just won a Peabody. And it's a story about a camp um, for kids with disabilities in the 70s. And then it goes on to follow some of the campers, and Judy's one of them, to where she goes and she she protests uh, the, the lack of support for people living with disabilities in California and, and gets shuts down a federal building with about 125 other uh, disability rights activists and they shut it down. Old school protesting, shutting down and getting that bill passed and getting the, the support that people with disabilities absolutely needed in that uh, during that time. Um, but that's old school. New school is great. Gaten Medarazzo, uh, who's living with cladal cranial dysplasia. And he's also the star of Stranger Things, and he writes into his contract every season that he has to mention cladal cranial dysplasia at least in two different episodes each season. And he uses his social media, his very powerful social media platform to raise awareness of not only cladal cranial dysplasia, but all rare disease. Extraordinary modern day activist. Right before the pandemic, I was traveling around the globe as I do, starting with a, a new initiative, working with individuals that were undiagnosed. When you have a diagnosis, of course, we all know that we have a, you have your network of families, you have your advocacy groups, you have your specialists, you have your support. When you're undiagnosed, you're pretty much alone. So in collaboration with the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, the Mayo Clinic, uh, NIH and others, uh, we started traveling to various centers of excellence for people that were undiagnosed, to creating opportunities to build community, to create opportunities to have, make sure people ensured that they were not left alone, that they did have community around them and families, that they could share similar experiences. Uh, they just hosted their international conference of two of us in um, virtual at the Mayo Clinic, but we created a beautiful virtual uh, exhibition that was launched there and will continue to, to, um, to be seen at the Mayo Clinic. This is beautiful Kaylin. Now Kaylin came to my studio to be photographed. She has Sturge Weber syndrome. She's a birthmark bilaterally across her face. She has an internal release, so she has a seizure disorder associated with it. And she also has glaucoma, so she's lost her, her vision in her left eye because of that as well. Uh, but she came to the studio to be photographed, and we created probably 18 billion photographs that day. We had so much fun. She was great. At the end of the shoot, her mom calls me. She says, Kayla never talks to me about school because she knows if her kids are teasing her, I'm going to come in the next day swinging a baseball bat. And that just makes things worse for her. So she says nothing. But on her way home from your studio, she said, Mom, kids tell me I'm ugly every single day. They tell me I'm a freak and I'm a monster. And I believe them until today. And then she mobilized. She got me to go to her school and present positive exposure to 400 freshman students. And she was on stage with me in her little Madonna-esque headphones running around screaming, what is normal? So this gorgeous kid created a formula that everything we need to create at positive exposure must follow. And that formula is self-acceptance equals self-esteem equals self-advocacy. So everything that we create, all our programming of positive exposures to place the tools in the hands of Kaylin and our other ambassadors and their families and friends and, and colleagues and, 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 and community to change the way the world sees difference. To so look beyond disease, beyond diagnosis, to the beauty and richness of our shared humanity. One of those programs is the Pearls Project. I would love for all you just to register for the Pearls Project. It's under our website, which is positiveexposure.org. Under programs, you'll see the Pearls Project. And it's an online blog platform where our ambassadors from around the globe have an opportunity to talk about life from their unique perspective. Here's, I'd like to introduce to you, Byron. Hi, my name is Byron. I live in the DC area. I'm 14. When I was 10 months old, I had a left hemispherectomy. Um, I had the left half of my brain removed because I have a, I have something called Sturge Weber syndrome. I wear a brace on the on my right leg and right arm. I only see out of the right side of each eye, so sometimes it's harder for me to see some see things on the right side. So playing sports can be frustrating because I might not see a ball coming. Um, um, I didn't see that coming. 
So the Pearls product provides an opportunity for our ambassadors to use their personalities, their sense of humor, to break down those um, the, 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 the boundaries behind their, around them, the social boundaries, preventing them from being active participants in their community by sharing, by being showing the humanity. Although each Pearl ambassador has very, their blogs are very active with video and film and photographs, but it's all very, it's a 100% safe environment because we do all the posting for our ambassadors. So it's like, it's great in schools and in, in educational programs. As I said, I go to a lot of family conferences, but I also and I speak to a lot of medical students. And we're now already speaking to over 50% of the medical schools here in the States. And I go not because I want to teach the science behind a lot of these conditions, but I can actually pronounce arthroposis multiplex congenitum. I can spell it. I know what it means, not because I studied it in a textbook, but because I went to a family conference and I met PJ. Now, PJ, the type of arthroposis that PJ has, he can't use his hands. So his parents call, his family calls his eating technique his Viking dive, because he goes into his plate of mashed potatoes and he comes up. And then he goes into his plate of peas and he comes up. And then he chases his sisters around the table with a face full of mashed potatoes and peas. You will never forget Arthur Riposa's multiplex congenitive ever, and because you'll never forget PJ. So now in the family conferences, when it's non-COVID, I they're ever, they're starting in June. They go through the end of August, and I often go to as many as I possibly can. The last two, two years they've been completely virtual, but that's changing hopefully. But I bring healthcare providers and training med students with me, and I shove them in daycare, and I lock the door on them, and then I check back in on them at the end of the day, and they always have like poop on their shoulder, like gum in their hair. But they're going to be better healthcare providers because they met these kids not in crisis. They met these kids not in the clinical environment. They met these kids early on, understanding that they're kids and they're people. Exactly. So we it sparked an idea to create a film library, well, an online film library that we can introduce a lot of our individuals uh, living with differences to healthcare providers in training. God, they can certainly understand all the basic hallmark characteristics of a feature diagnosis, but that feature diagnosis and those hallmark characteristics are presented by somebody living with that condition themselves or their families, placing front row and center in medical education humanity, helping healthcare providers in training early in their training understand that it's never what you're treating, but always who you're treating. Here's a, a, a sample of frame. My name is Noah, and I'd like to introduce you to some of my friends. We all have a genetic condition called albinism. You may have seen us in movies or heard that we're all evil or have magic powers or have red eyes. We're like any other group of people. We're all different. We're all unique. And you will see here the diversity among us. Albinism affects people across the world from all ethnicities. But it's not only in humans. It affects animals, too, and all kinds of them as well. There are two main types of albinism, ocular cutaneous and ocular albinism. Ocular cutaneous affects the eyes, the skin, and the hair, and ocular affects just the eyes. Today's my birthday. My name is Alex. And I'm Ezra. And this is Cassie and Penelope. Hello. Hello. And Cassie was born with a genetic syndrome called Marfan syndrome. We wanted to show you a feature Cassie was born with. As you can see, Cassie's chest sinks inward toward the middle. This is called pectus excavatum. But Penelope, what is it that you call, you and Cassie call it? Target. Target. Why do we call it a target, Cass? Because Penelope likes to shoot water. Like, she used to laugh all the time when I put water in it. Why would you put water in there? Because that's what made her laugh. Can you take a picture of it? I am. I'm doing it right now. I'm making a movie of it. Chromosomes are the instructions that tell our bodies how to grow and develop. Most people have two copies of each chromosome for a total of 46 chromosomes. Some people have 47 chromosomes. Most people who have Down syndrome have three copies of chromosome 21, also known as trisomy 21. This is caused by a sporadic event known as non-disjunction which usually occurs prior to conception. Hi, I'm Mitch. I'm 15 years old. It's been a great world for me. It's basically like an extra 
a Mazone and that Mazone blends in the awesomeness and blends in all of the loyalty and you know I, I could go on and on about, about it but <laughs> and Max can go on and on about it and he really does go on and on about it every chance he gets he's an extraordinary ambassador for the Down Syndrome Society here in the States um, and so each film, they're all based on under programs, again, on our website, positiveexposure.org. Each film is accompanied by a photographic gallery showing and representing diversity within that diagnosis, but then also links to all, uh, uh, informative websites and links that kind of help you get, get more information. If, if the films themselves are only eight to 12 minutes long. So if you need more information, you can actually follow the links. So check them out when you get a chance. Uh, we were just come. We just completed. We have, we're right in the rough cut category right now of two frames that we were funded by an organization called the With Foundation. One is early onset Alzheimer's in our d adults living with Down syndrome, and I'd like to show you a little sample uh, of that. Now, keeping in mind, Michelle does not have a diagnosis of it's Alzheimer's. It's very difficult. When Michelle was born, we were told she'd live to be 40. Now her life, ex so I thought, okay, I'm in my 20s. I can handle that. Now her life expectancy, which is great, is 65. I know I'm not going to outlive her. They also didn't tell us about the early aging and the possibility of dementia. It doesn't affect everybody, but pretty much everybody that's been in our circle of the individuals who have lived at home, um, which were all very high functioning individuals. They had competitive jobs. They could take public transportation. They would begin to develop behaviors of forgetfulness, confusion, not wanting to socialize, go to the bowling, the dances, the events. And as a family member, I've, I've accepted the possibility. I ran a big medical clinic with 800 patients with multiple developmental disabilities and we would have residents and nurse practitioners come through and rotate there and some of them would just kind of walk into the room and just stand there because they had never been exposed to anybody with a developmental disability but I think once you realize they're really just like anybody else they may just communicate differently you need to listen to them you need to speak to them not the person that brought them um, and you need to really hear what they're saying to you and that's the amazing Michelle. The other film that we created is, is Epilepsy in Adults with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities as well. And here's a sample of that. We have a saying with Dawn. Dawn is consistently inconsistent. We saw the regression. We saw her body changing. We saw her balance getting poor, um, walking with the crouch and everything. And it wasn't part of the typical uh, Lennox Gusto. You know, this doesn't fit into Lennox Gusto. There's something else going on. When we found out that it was Dravet, it, it, you always have in the back of your mind. So what else is going on with her? If it's not Lennox Gusto, what else is going on with her? And let's find it. That's salvation we had. It was the yeah. greatest feeling when the genetic testing came back and showed that she was positive for the SCN1A genetic mutation. It was the answer that we have waited for. I don't know, what was she, 45 when she had that test? But it, it's like everything makes sense. And so those will be finished probably in the next couple of weeks. So we're just doing some final. And sorry that those two were not captioned because it's still in the rough, in the rough edits. Uh, we've also walked away from, stepped aside from the genetics community as well to create other films working with communities at risk of stigma and exclusion. Uh, this is a collaboration with Walter Reed and the Wounded Warriors, a film that we created in collaboration with Uniformed Services University in, in Bethesda on limb salvage, amputation, and prosthetic usage. And in collaboration with NYU Langone, we created an exhibition that launched at Lululemon here in New York City, but then went on to New York, uh, NYU Langone in New York, an exhibition on our transgender community. Uh, we opened a gallery in, in East Harlem, which I'm, which I'm in right now. It's a gallery uh, in, on the northern part of Museum Mile, uh, right at the northern part of, of, of 
a Central Park. A lot of activity, non-COVID times, of course, but now it's what, since during COVID, we're actually having a lot of um, by appointment only. It's very strict protocol. We've done a lot of work outside. We have a, a beautiful courtyard that we're able to utilize and do photography in. We just installed a mural of the word love in over 100 languages. It's a four-story mural. We have a very active artist in residence a division. We shoot a lot of film here, performances when it's safe to do performances as well. Our ex and so you're all first of all, you're all invited to come to New York and visit our gallery. So please come as soon as you can. We're here. It's by it's not open to the public every day, but we're here every day and by appointment only. But we'll just come and see. There's so much going here. The exhibitions change and rotate. There's a lot of performance. We have an in-house poetry group uh, with that call themselves the outside voices, and they're all in individuals that identify as having an IDD, all adults, and they have, they, have, they say we're like, we're like smooth, cool ice cream on a hot July day. And they're just, it's just delicious. And so you have to come, and if you can come, I demand you come and visit. So thanks. And this is another exhibition that we created. All of our exhibits are very, very high uh, profile, very public. This is uh, an exhibition on Hunter Syndrome that launched in Grand Central Station, New York City. And then when we did a lot of pre-production photography in Poland, Germany, and Russia. So we went back to the streets of Warsaw, the train station in Berlin, Berlin, and several malls in Russia and Moscow. I work in collaboration quite often with hospitals, local hospitals and hospitals around the country, creating opportunities to photograph the frequent flyers of that community, but presenting them on in, in, in an exhibition and in, 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 in a presentation where they get to talk a little bit more about themselves. They get to present themselves not in crisis, but talk about their pets, their families, who they are and things like that. So that's kind of these are we just did a collaboration recently with Metropolitan Hospital just down the street from us here and then continue to do so everywhere in the globe. Uh, this is an exhibition that we've created with individuals living with intellectual developmental disabilities and an organization called the Resource Exchange in Colorado Springs, servicing people living with IDD. Uh, the exhibition celebrated 65 lives of people living with the community, in the community, living with intellectual developmental disabilities. Uh, we collaborated with other photographers in the area, so the exhibition continued to, to, continued to grow. Uh, the exhibition was meant to be in this beautiful gallery that was hosted by a, a mall in, in Colorado Springs for about six to eight weeks. and wound up being there for about two and a half years, and they estimated over two and a half million people went through that exhibit, so it's pretty intense. And a lot of the stars of the exhibit became docents and held community events in the gallery itself. Did the exact same thing since was such a success in, in uh, Australia. And I did all this photography in, on the Sunshine Coast in Sydney. And as we we're about to move to, to Melbourne, we had to pull back just a little bit because of COVID. And but it's all raring to go. As soon as we get the green light and we can we're gonna move on into into um, Melbourne and then other parts of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, this is an exhibition at the, muse at the museum of um, the Rochester Museum, uh, the George Eastman Museum, sorry, in Rochester. UNESCO in Paris, uh, an exhibition on chronic spontaneous urticaria and psoriasis that went to, we photographed in over 30 countries. This is the launch in Bangkok. Our first uh, billboard on the road from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and our launch in positive exposure Europe, fully digitized exhibition. This is one in a bank in Ghent. And that's our change how you see, see how you change. I did want to just add, add one, you know, I, I, just before we, we close here, I, I speak to so many healthcare providers and training in hospitals and communities and teachers and teacher training programs, always to celebrate the beauty of, of, of our of shared humanity. But I also go to schools and speak to students and talk to them about how we can possibly work together and create opportunities to really celebrate. So I said, well, I'm a fashion photographer. So I, I create images to celebrate diversity. What can you do? One kid raises his hand. Says, well, I, 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 you know, I'm going to be a writer. I'm like, that's amazing. You'll be instantly, you'll be a pearl ambassador, and then we can collaborate on books and movies and 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 and, and magazine articles, and we can use images and things. So he's in that. Another kid raises her hand and says she wanted to be a healthcare provider or a traditional healer in her community. Fantastic, and elevate your status in community. That's great. And another kid raises her hand and said, well, I, you know, we have a school choir. Now, I know from my experience in South Africa that school choirs are really important. A school choir is what puts a, a school on the map. It's how they, they, they kind of 
attract you know the great teachers it's how they fund their computer labs so so she said i said well, are you guys any good have you ever competed she says oh no no we can't compete because we we're disabled i'm like well, i don't think that's a rule i said so let me hear you sing so they did right there in the schoolyard they were amazing i went back into the teachers the uh, principal's office and sure enough in the back of the local newspaper was a listing of at least 10 local school choir competitions so we entered them in all Six months later, I'm back in my studio in New York City and I get a call from the principal who's screaming on the phone. He's so excited. I'm like, what? He said, you're not going to believe this, but we've just been invited to be the, 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 the guest choir. We're not competing, but the guest choir, the national competition here in Johannesburg to sing one song in front of the audience of 10,000 people. I'm like, that's fantastic. He's like, no, they've never gone. They've never performed in front of anybody else but you. They're not going to go unless you come back and go with them. So like, we never have any money at Positive Exposure. Everything goes into programming, but I thought this was important. So I reached out to a couple of our sponsors and sure enough, I was able to go. And I want to share with you just before I close, the first time I heard these gorgeous kids performing in their schoolyard. And then the second little piece I added is them doing their final dress rehearsal in the national and this parking lot of the National Auditorium in Johannesburg. You'll see we were a little nervous. Second trip or our final dress rehearsal, you'll see we were very nervous. This I never heard the sound of applause before, it scared me. But they rallied. Adding a little piece to this. It's another trip that I went. Something changed on campus. Something was different on campus when I arrived on this third trip. <laughs> so, what has changed is these gorgeous kids who were told that they couldn't compete because they had a disability actually competed in the national competition 
and they won. <laughs> so these kids are now traveling through South Africa, all over South Africa, going into schools where normally they would be bullied or have bottles thrown at them, and instead they're getting standing ovations. Like all of us, we, can, we all have that talent inside of us to celebrate the beauty and richness of our shared humanity. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm hugging y'all. Thank you, thank you so much. Rick, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm telling you what, Lion King on Broadway has nothing on those kids. <laughs> amazing. That's right, right? amazing, that was amazing. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm just so happy that uh, you shared that with us. Uh, your presentation, Rick, was so informative, profound and poignant to say the least. Truly, what an amazing and beautiful endeavor. And I, uh, I'm just so happy that people like you exist to do work like this. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's it's very awesome to see. Uh, so we are now ready to begin our question and answer session. And uh, I would like people to write your questions in the Q&A box you will see on the side of your screens. Uh, I'll kick things off with a question before I pass it over to, to Deanna to moderate the rest of the, of the question and answer session. So Rick, my question is, here in the Faculty of Dentistry, we offer our students a variety of outreach rotations and experiences that give them the opportunity to treat some of the more vulnerable populations in our city uh, and individuals with differences and special needs. Is there anything, uh, in your opinion, we can do or tell our students to help them prepare for these experiences uh, that might make them feel a bit more comfortable right from the beginning? Beautiful question, Sasha. Uh, yeah, always to see the humanity, first and foremost. To look that person right in the eye, know that there's somebody sitting there looking right back at them. Make sure you make those connections. It doesn't have to be a long relationship where you have to go to dinner or lunch and, and chat in just a few minutes, but making those connections, seeing that unit, that person, not seeing a diagnosis, not seeing a disease, but seeing that person and connecting with them, making that, seeing that person directly. And also, and I've learned this the hard way, when you're not authentic, kids will take you down. So you have to be your authentic self and on your guard. But again, it's just making that connection, realizing that there's a person there that, that whether they can communicate or not using the traditional means, there's still somebody there. There's somebody that, that's going to change your life if you allow them. And the beauty exists in technicolor. I agree. Kids are way smarter than we give them credit for. And they can see through everything. Thank you. All right, Deanna, floor is all yours to get some questions going here. We haven't had any questions come through yet, but we have had a few comments um, just thanking Rick about the amazing presentation and commending him on his work for making people feel beautiful and that everyone deserves to feel beautiful and that what he is doing is is really, uh, really special because he's allowing people to feel that way. Well, it's great. Thanks, Deanna, for that. Sometimes people a bit to warm up for questions, Rick. I'm sure we'll have something soon. No worries, no worries. I would like to comment on that if that's okay, because about the, may help you people feel beautiful. One, you know, right before the pandemic, I was in Bamako in West Africa, working on this undiagnosed program. And I was in a village a couple hours outside of the city. And I was photographing and, our, and the interpreter that we had didn't speak that particular dialect. So communication was difficult, but the, everybody understands the word. Wow, amazing. So it's very, easy to make those connections and you don't have to have to and, but as I'm photographing this young boy Lou is his name um, I realized that no matter what continent I'm on which country I'm in which language we're speaking which village we're in people all have the same need and that means all of us have share the same need and it's a need to be seen a need to be heard and a need to belong and that's kind of the simply everything that we do Wonderful. Dan, anything pop in there? Uh, I do have uh, some other questions that have come through and one of them I'm going to apologize because I am not a dentist and have not been to dental or dental hygiene school, so I will try to pronounce the words correctly. <laughs> um, but one of them is, have you ever photographed anyone with dental anomalies, including people with ectodermal dysplasia or amelogenesis imperfecta? 
Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yes, I have actually, and I've even been to the family advocacy conferences as well. Um, and there's like, and, and also like individual with cladal cranial dysplasia as well. So, and I find it's the same thing. So there are a lot of, you know, looking at the dental component to a lot of the things that we do. Um, I'm looking to this community because I, I think there was a connection when I first started speaking with the whole community here, the early days to plan this, this talk. I'm hoping that everyone that would here will come up with a lot of ideas of ways that we can clever, whether it be me being the photographer or we could find a local photographer there or create opportunities to celebrate those differences for sure. And to, and, and to provide a platform for all of our individuals with ectodermal dysplasia that's going to and talk about themselves, talk about who they are and to present and have that platform of visibility and to see beauty in them. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Back to you. I do have another question that popped into me separately because the individual could not find where to put it, so they texted me. But sure. the question is, have you ever had the opportunity to collaborate with the Special Olympics? Oh, yes. The Special Olympics and their healthy communities, healthy athletes. You know, we just, uh, it's, I, I went to the World Games a couple of years ago and blown away, blown away. We have a really great friend, Dr. Steve Perlman, who we had a, our big uh, celebration fundraiser uh, Wednesday night this week, and he was one of our honorees. And he started the Special Olympics, uh, healthy athletes, healthy communities, and just extraordinary. So absolutely. And our executive director, before she joined Positive Exposure, she has actually has a daughter who has a chromosome 18 anomaly, and that's how we connected. But she's been volunteering at the at the special Olympics for years and years, like since she was when she was in high school. So there's so there's a lot of connection with the special Olympics and what they're doing. It's just amazing. So yes, thank you. Uh, do you have any plans for exhibitions in Canada? Well, I. Funny you should ask. <laughs> I think we should create some. We don't. We have some ideas. We're working with uh, several organizations in Canada. I think we need to do something and community based there in Canada and create an opportunity to have an exhibition that can travel throughout to all different provinces in Canada. But starting off, it could even starting there to house there and then and move on. But there's from what I, all the organizations that I've met recently that are Canadian advocacy groups whether or, or at healthcare centers or institutions have a whole beautiful representation of making sure that and they already get the idea that we need to celebrate our community. They need to be they need to see their own beauty. And I feel like there's a lot of passion coming from 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 our, our, our the, the, from the north to, to down to New York City. So Nothing's really planned right now, but I think something's going to happen very, very soon. I promise to get the correct COVID test to come start in that one, I promise. Um, but yeah, no, I, th I think something will absolutely happen. So great question. Thank you. I look forward to doing that. Thanks, Deanna. Back to you. Uh, we have another question. How does advocacy change and blossom into systematic change? Ooh, great question. Not, by you know, being your authentic self, by again following that equation, self-acceptance equals self-esteem equals self-advocacy. It's not going to be one person or one advocacy group or one photographer or one nonprofit or anything. If we all have to work in concert, hand in hand, arm in arm, it's going to take an army to create that systemic change and to be relentless and not just to be to not just to be in support of, but to be active participants in changing the way the world sees difference. Thanks. Uh, I have another two questions. So the first one is, out of all of your experiences, which would you consider the most rewarding? <laughs> Good question, but not a fair question. Great question. They're all really, they're all pretty incredible. I couldn't pick up one or another. So they've all just been, into, but I'll tell you the thing that I love the most when I'm shooting though, when I'm photographing somebody and they're standing in front of my camera and they're blossoming and they're, they're celebrating and they're just bouncing around with all this energy. I always love shoot looking just past their shoulder to the, to the eyes of their mom 
their dad, their partner, their friend, their sibling, to see that person glowing even brighter than the person on photograph goes, finally, somebody sees their loved one the way that they see them through their eyes. And they're, and it becomes this extraordinary love fest. <laughs> it's really it's so much fun. Thanks, Deanna, back to you. And last question we have is, can you tell us the name of the Pearl Site project? Yes, uh, on our website, which is positiveexposure.org, you go you go under to programs, and then you just you'll drop there. You'll see pearls. You'll see frame. All of our frame films are there. All the photographic galleries are there. The links for the different frames. But under pearls, you just click on pearls, and it'll ask you to register. Registration free. But when, once you register, we just keep it very safe, so we get everybody to collect emails that way. We won't use them or solicit any of those. It's just for the pearls project, uh, and it's just with this way we know who's there viewing the the emails and, and the, the the blog posts, and then we'll also we'll approve. It and then you've got a selection of ambassadors from around the globe that you can read and share and, and share with the teachers and healthcare providers and training and practitioners and families and other other friends. So, but that's where the pearls. Everything is housed in our website under positiveexposure.org. Thanks, Dan. All right. Uh... Thank you, Rick. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation this evening and for fielding all those great questions. Uh, I think I can speak for all of us when I say that it has been truly incredibly uh, uplifting to hear about the impact your photography, education, and advocacy, advocacy has had. Uh, here in the Faculty of Dentistry, we also strive to recognize in all our patients that need to be seen, to be heard, and to belong. Uh, I think you've inspired us all. Thank you so much. And everyone have a wonderful evening and thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. So I'm Thanks, not everybody. Here.